Good morning from the Oklahoma Insurance Department. My name is Rachel Fan, and I work in the Communications Division here at OID. Thank you so much for joining us for our Senior Fraud Webinar Series. For your awareness, I do want to mention that this webinar is being recorded. Before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about what the Oklahoma Insurance Department, or OID, does. OID is a state agency, and we are responsible for regulating the insurance market and enforcing the insurance-related laws of the state. We have an entire team devoted to protecting consumers by providing them with accurate information and timely assistance. We can also help deal with your insurance company if you cannot reach an agreement regarding a claim. If you would like to reach out to us for help or if you have any questions, you can call toll-free at 1-800-522-0071. And you can also visit our website at oid.ok.gov. For today's webinar, you will be able to see and hear us. However, we cannot see or hear you. If you have a question, please feel free to post that in the chat. Down at the bottom of your screen, you will see several options, one of those being chat. And if you click on that, you can type your question there. We will save time to answer questions at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce Ray Walker. Ray is the Divisional Director for the Medicare Assistance Program at the Oklahoma Insurance Department. Mr. Walker has over 20 years of experience working in and around the healthcare industry, primarily in insurance, and he has had the privilege of speaking to groups across the state and around the country. Ray, over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our fourth webinar in 2022. Uh, this week's topic is getting cyber safe tips to use the internet and digital tools safely. So I'm really looking forward to this because I'm probably the most dangerous person on the internet uh, today. So over the past three weeks, we've had webinars on social security fraud, banking fraud, and contractor and provider fraud. And if you missed those events, don't worry about it. You can go to our website and pull up those recordings and watch them at your leisure. And we'll talk to you a little bit more toward the end of the, uh, today's event about how to get to that website so that you can look at those uh, webinars. Uh, for those of you who are attending for the first time, we're very happy that you joined us and we hope you can join us for our other webinars in this series. They're gonna be coming up every Wednesday for the next several weeks. And at the end of the presentation, we'll pop up a list of those remaining webinars so you can decide which of those you might be interested in seeing and how you can register for those. Uh, these events, by the way, are made possible in part through funding that we receive from our Senior Medicare Patrol Grant through the Administration for Community Living. This is a grant that gives us funding to go out and educate seniors on how they can protect themselves from becoming a victim of fraud, waste, and abuse in the Medicare system. It's estimated that we lose $60 billion every year from the Medicare Trust Fund due to inappropriate activities. And that's a lot of money that could be going toward medical care and things that it really should be going to. I mean, think about how much medical care $60 billion would cover. So it's very important that we work together as a team to try to identify possible fraud, report it, and try to bring it to a stop. So now I wanna introduce our speaker for today, uh, Ms. Joy McGill. Joy McGill serves as the Associate State Director of Community Outreach for AARP Oklahoma. In this role, Joy drives AARP's local presence and outreach to serve Oklahomans age 50 plus and enhance their quality of life through the aging process. Joy facilitates elder abuse and fraud prevention work supporting AARP's National Fraud Watch Network program to help Oklahomans protect themselves and their families from scams and, and fraud. Joy is a frequent fraud prevention contributor on Tulsa CBS affiliates Fraud Watch Wednesday educational news segment. Additionally, she advocates for state laws and regulations to stop scams and shut down fraud attempts. Joy is also a regional board member for the Oklahoma Arkansas chapter of the International Association of Financial Crime Investigators. In addition to fraud prevention work, McGill facilitates AARP programming support, supporting livable communities, family caregiving, food security, and veteran engagement. McGill also facilitates community partnerships and programming and develops and engages AARP volunteer partners in their associated work. Joy, we're very excited to have you and we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. 
morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ray, for the warm welcome. Uh, it's always such a pleasure to work with Ray and the entire Oklahoma Insurance Department team. We all work very closely in alignment, uh, as well as with the other partners that you all have seen. Um, with the previous webinars and the, the future ones that are coming up, because it's really at the crux of what we're here to talk about today is fraud prevention. Um, with the internet and our cell phones and our tablets and all of the new technology that's coming online, um, new content every single day, uh, it's really important to be aware of all of the new scams and the resources out there. Uh, as mentioned, all of the resources that the insurance department has provided for you leading up to today and in the future. But I'm here today to share with you some tips on cybersecurity and cyber safety and knowing some of the new things that are out there or maybe some of the old things that we might need reminders on, on what we really can do to make sure that we're being as safe as possible and protecting our own identities and our technology. So first of all, I do wanna share a little bit about AARP and our Fraud Watch Network. Oftentimes people think about AARP um, only on the membership side when you get your card, when you turn 50 and some great discounts. We do so much more than that, especially on the nonprofit side for where I work uh, with our state office that's located in the Oklahoma City area. We do offer a wonderful program uh, that we're talking about today called the Fraud Watch Network that is a resource for everyone, regardless of membership, regardless of age. Uh, and it really cr uh, provides some really important topical information, educational information, and support. So like we're doing today, the Fraud Watch Network will help you stay informed as well as our staff that's located here in the state. And then we also have a helpline uh, which I'll provide all the contact information for them uh, before we wrap up today. We have a helpline that's staffed with volunteers that are a, just a tremendous support system for individuals that may believe that they have been uh, victims of a scam or a fraud, or maybe they've seen something that they're concerned about and just wanna make sure uh, before they move forward with any sort of adjustments there. And then finally, uh, our Fraud Watch Network and our state office team offer the opportunity for you to have a voice. We share information about uh, current legislation that's coming up. We advocate for you at the Capitol, both uh, on the state and federal level in terms of laws to go after the scammers and the criminals that are really trying to steal your hard-earned money. So that's just a bit of a baseline of why I'm here today and why I'm presenting these, informations, uh, these information for you on behalf of AARP. So we're gonna talk about a number of different areas today in terms of online cybersecurity frauds and scams. But it's important to understand the difference between a data breach um, and, uh, and your actual theft, so to speak. So when, you're, when it's a data breach, your information is viewed or stolen, uh, just viewed rather. Um, otherwise, then when once it's impacted, it's stolen or used by unauthorized individuals. So when you make it, you may subscribe to different products that provide resources in terms of um, information about if your, if your password is turned up somewhere on a nefarious list or your email has been um, discovered uh, in the dark web, which we'll talk about briefly, that's a breach. But before they get to the point of tapping into your bank account or stealing your medical records or something like that, that becomes a whole different scenario of what the, of what the problem is that really impacts perhaps your credit, your bank account, or um, things like your Social Security or your Medicare. So we're going to watch a short video to show you a little bit about what social engineering is to give you kind of a framework of how we get to the point that some of your information uh, from the online world gets stolen. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample of vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice elicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. 
I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go go for it. I'm gonna spoof from your number, so it's gonna look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi, I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan and we just had a baby and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, at gmail .com? Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. You're going to have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. Okay, so that's kind of disturbing, right? It's very disturbing to see how easy that was for uh, that personal information to be so easily transmitted um, in the hands of, of the bad guys, frankly. So let's talk a little bit about the identity theft versus the identity fraud. When the theft happens, your identity has been compromised. Perhaps it is just floating out there with the scammers and they haven't done anything with it yet, or it may not be a scammer. It may just be someone who's mining the information fraudulently to sell to a scammer. Whereas with fraud, that stolen identity has actually been used. So um, they may open up an, a new credit card in your name, uh, withdraw your bank account um, funds, for example. And so that's what happens once the fraud has been committed. So when we see examples of what was in the video just now with the person who is uh, getting their information stolen, where does it go? What happens? So that is where the dark web comes in. And this is something that is, a, a, it sounds just as nefarious as it is, and dark web is a great term for it. So if you look at the graphic on your screen, the surface web is basically where good people like you and me visit every day. That's where we go to check our news, uh, weather sources, our email, maybe do a little bit of online shopping. It's the primary place that the good people utilize the internet, frankly. The deep web and the dark web are the areas where uh, it's much harder to access. It's not available as easily, um, certainly on the dark web, it's hidden. Special software is needed download onto your computer, and it really is a place that is, it's the dark space. It's where uh, illegal trade happens a lot, a lot of um, um, black market drug sales go on, um, gun sales, things that are typically not legal activities are going on on the dark web. And it's pretty fascinating to think about um, so much traffic happens there that you never think about. But that's where these lists that may come along where um, uh, a website data bank may be um, unauthorized with an access router and your information is stolen. So these scammers will sell this information to the people who then go in and then utilize it and perhaps put you in a situation where your identity is stolen or um, your bank accounts are used. So here's some important prevention strategies to look at to make sure that you're being as safe as possible, to make sure that if, for example, an account is, or a, a, a website or something is compromised with your personal data, how you can make sure that you're staying safe. Freeze your credit, and it's easy to do that with the different credit agencies. You just have to go through the process of letting them know that that's the choice that you'd like to do on your account. So what that means is that when your credit is frozen, if for some reason you need to reuse your credit for, an, for a certain reason, 
it truly is frozen. You will have to go back in and unfreeze it to be able to have any sort of credit transactions. However, that also means that if your credit is frozen, that if someone tries to do something like opening up a credit card in your name or try to misuse your credit service, um, they can't do so because it's frozen. And again, just a reminder, if you do choose to freeze your credit, which is a great idea, you will have to unfreeze it if you want to do anything that's going to impact any sort of um, credit transactions, like buying a car, or maybe buying something that you would otherwise put on a, a, a credit service. Second, monitor your account. It's incredibly important to keep an eye on all of your credit um, services, whether you've gotten your account frozen or not, also your bank account. Uh, if you have the ability to set alerts to be able to see anything that uh, may be out of the ordinary or um, transactions that may be coming and going there, you can set it a limit of saying, you know, if anything happens on my bank account for, per se, my debit account that is more than a $200 transaction, you can oftentimes set alerts on those. And then also, it will also um, offer you the opportunity to prevent the hackers from setting up access because it will give you that warning. And then finally, make sure that you're using a password manager for things like your email accounts or your um, or anything you're signing up for online, so to speak. Even if it's a, a commerce website, like a, something you're buying online, or even something as simple as a, a program, like I utilize a website that sends me free yoga tips every day. There's no money that's being exchanged there, but I do have a personal account um, with an email address and a password attached to it. So the utilization of the password manager will create unique passwords for each of these accounts. I'm guilty. Um, Ray said that he maybe was a violator of not always being safe online. I'm just as guilty, um, at least in the early days of the internet. I used the same password often until I got wise to the fact that that's how scammers are hacking into our accounts and, and getting into our personal information. Using a password manager creates a very unique password for everything you're signing up for, and then it remembers it for you. And so the, the key is there that the passwords are incredibly unique with, frankly, kind of gibberish, and it's very hard to remember all those by memory. And obviously, it's not safe to write them down and put them in your a pocketbook because someone may steal your pocketbook. So it's a great way to capture all of that information and it be safe, and then you can access that when you need to log in and out of things. Okay, so moving on, let's do a quick quiz. What percentage of people don't use a passcode for their smartphone? 10%, 19%, or 28%? So the answer to that is probably what you would guess is 28%, which is kind of crazy to think about because that's basically like saying you are 28% of the time leaving your wallet or your purse or something, just setting out there, maybe just out there for anybody to take off of your porch, uh, just be able to access your information anytime. It's very important to make sure that you're utilizing password protection on your smartphone, on your tablets, uh, anything that's got an access point into anything that you have personal data on. So when you're looking at how to keep your email, your online accounts, and your overall system safe, make sure that you're using the um, unique passwords like we talked about a bit ago. Some sites offer uh, two-factor authentication, and what that means is that you may log in with the password that you have signed up for, but then it will also say, we need to verify this is you and send you a text, or it may, may be to your email account, or whatever their two-factor authentication system is. If that is an option for the website or the apps or things that you're using, it's important to turn those on. It is an extra step. It's usually very quick to um, take care of that two-factor authentication. Um, it seems like it might be a hassle, but getting your information hacked or your personal identity stolen or the money out of your bank account, that's a hassle. So an extra few seconds is really worth it in this scenario. Again, use the password manager. Um, I got a question last week from a group of people, how do you get a password manager? 
take a look at the system provider you have, whether it's through your particular smartphone or tablet, that's, the, that's what I personally use. Um, if you're not sure if you have that, you might speak with whoever helps you with your email system or who you buy your computer through, uh, but they can help advise you on what you have access to. And then finally, on your computer or your smartphone, and even things like a, a printer in your home or your office that may have a Wi-Fi connection, if it's got an operation system, make sure you're keeping that up to date. That's another one that does seem like it's a little bit of a hassle because, you know, it comes up from time to time. And it's like, oh, I just updated it. It's going to take more time. to. It's going to keep me from doing the things that I need to do from uh, day to day. It's really important to make sure that you're keeping those operation systems updated. Uh, typically, when these updates happen, there are security patches. When the systems are created, uh, the, the system creators do the best they can to make sure that there's not any holes that the scammers uh, and the hackers can get into. But with all scams, things continue to evolve, hacking continues to evolve, and they, uh, these hackers are able to sometimes find these holes. So it's really important that when these um, system updates come along, it's important for you to keep it um, as updated as you on all of your tools. Okay, so another quiz. Which activity is safe to perform over a Wi-Fi public connection? And when I say a Wi-Fi public connection, what I mean there is something that, that's not in your own home that you have protected on your own. That would be if you're at the airport or at the grocery store or somewhere that's in a public space that you are not controlling what the security is. So is it safe to check the weather, to bank online, or to buy things? The answer to that is pretty easy, to check the weather. That's the only thing that's not attached to any of your own personal information that maybe you haven't, you don't have any sort of identifiable information that's set up there. But unfortunately, that's really the only safe thing that you can do. The, the, you wouldn't realize that there are a lot of public Wi-Fi scams out there, and the hackers can get into these public Wi-Fi systems if they're not as protected as they, they really should be. It's really important don't access sensitive information over public Wi-Fi. That means, unfortunately, if you're sitting at the airport and need to check your bank account, you really need to do that on your, over your own personal data connection and not through the Wi-Fi that's being offered by the public um, entity. As you're looking uh, to log on to Wi-Fi, if you need to check the weather or to um, access the Internet for the safe things, make sure that when you're accessing the different Wi-Fi options, you're verifying the true public network. I know that sometimes when I travel and I'm in airports, it'll pop up and say several different, what look to be legitimate uh, Wi-Fi connections for the airport, when it turns out that there's really only the one that is the official and hopefully the most likely protected site. So be diligent to make sure that you really are signing on to a Wi-Fi that you want to before you um, hit, that, hit that confirm button. And then finally, in your own home Wi-Fi, make sure that you have that secure. Make sure that you are using a password. Oftentimes, the password is already created for you. Uh, I know in my own home, the password was created, and it's on the bottom of the, um, of the Wi-Fi unit. Um, I chose not to change it because it was a pretty complex password when I got it, but you are also able to go into the system and change it to a password that you would prefer if that's what you would like. Okay, let's talk a bit about scam alert and tech safety. We talked a little bit about making sure that your operating systems are updated. Um, but one of the things that can happen is that you get a, a pop-up all of a sudden on your computer that says virus alert, or uh, there's a technical problem with your particular operating system. Typically, it's used in a, in a way uh, that it comes across as being very urgent, like your, your system's going to crash, the world is about to end, you have to take action now. And what happens there when these scammers do that is that what we call getting under the ether. They create a situation that creates a high level of anxiety or action of importance right then and there. And in this particular scenario, you may get the pop-up or you may get a telephone call from someone representing themselves from uh, your internet service provider or your computer um, maker. And what they're, so what they'll say is, 
um, you know, we see this problem with your computer. You've got a virus. You've got a major system issue. We just need for you to provide us remote access to your computer, and we'll go in and fix it so you can go on with your day. And oftentimes they represent themselves as the service provider. They will say, hi, I'm Joe from Microsoft. Um, I, you know, I see that you have this problem, and we're going to help you fix this today. If this happens, it's very, very likely a scam. This is one of the largest scams that are reported out there in terms of technology. And what happens is when they, when you allow them to remote access into your computer, again, it's sort of like my scenario of just leaving your purse setting out in the open for anyone to take. They're basically going into your computer, often putting nasty bugs in there that can take over your whole system, disable the system, and it gives them access to anything that you have utilized uh, to do your online banking or your email or any of your personal private data. And then it may also just totally crash your system, which is also a significant issue. So here's what you should do. Anytime you get someone that calls or if you get a strange pop-up, do not give access to your computer. Again, make sure that you've got your software updated. Uh, make sure that you've got your antivirus scan running to make sure that you don't have any of these things that are getting um, injected into your computer on the back end that you're unaware of. Certainly, if something like this happens, make sure that you contact your bank uh, if, if, you, if your information has been stolen. Uh, again, anytime that you have any banking information that may be compromised, you are safer on the transaction with credit card companies because they can reverse some of those charges. Um, with debit card transactions, that's a lot tougher, but make sure that you contact your financial institution to see, to A, let them know that this, this situation has happened uh, and to possibly freeze your account and then see what uh, remediation you may be able to have. And then of course, as we talked about a little earlier, the Fraud Watch Network Helpline offers tremendous guidance and support on next steps for you um, and if this happens. All right, let's talk about one of the other areas that feels like it's the thing that infiltrates all of our email boxes, our text messages on our phones every day. It's these uh, scam and spam emails or spam texts. This is a screenshot I just wanted you all to see of, of the junk mail or the spam box uh, of an email account that I have. And if you look through this, there's a lot of red flags, and we're going to go into a couple of other screens to show you just a few more, more detailed red flags and things that you should look at. But a lot of this, just at a glance, things are just don't seem quite right. They're not personalized. Um, legitimate organizations and, and online services that send you emails that you've signed up for, they, they do a good job of making sure that things are personalized, whereas with things like what you're seeing on the screen, it just is all, it's just all junk, and you can see that it looks like junk. So here's a couple of closer looks. Let's look at the warning signs here. So on the email here on the on, uh, left that says, hello, Joy McGill, we need to confirm your info. I wouldn't typically even open this email for a number of reasons, but for the purpose of showing you this today, um, you see that there are some real red flags. There's a lot of typos. There's a lot of um, misspellings, um, punctuation issues, the things, uh, and then the things, language like, the sooner you act, the sooner it can be in your hands. Well, another big red flag coming from the Raging Bull Casino. I've never been to the Raging Bull Casino, so I'm not sure why they would be offering me $3,500 here for some sort of award. Uh, so that's a huge red flag. Uh, another red flag here is the way that the date line is written, the Wednesday 31 March 2021. Typically, especially with um, U.S. vendors and email senders, they use the more traditional way of um, the month, day, year versus the opposite. And we know that a lot of scammers are offshore from the United States. So that's a pretty significant red flag. Not always 100% of the case, but typically if you see that, especially on an email you're not expecting, it's a scam. And then also, um, you know, you see strange, on the verify here, there's strange tick mark there, just 
it's just everything looks messy. And if something looks messy, typos, anything out of the ordinary, it's time to be really skeptical. Same thing on the, the text message screenshot that I have on the other side. I got this text message unsolicited. Um, I've never subscribed to any sort of um, text or information about wanting to order any sort of tea. But what's really questionable about this particular screen is the URL that you can click. It's the item that's there, that's the .com that's underlined in blue. You would think that if it's a tea company, it would be bigbellytea.com or something along those lines that go correspond with what's being um, communicated there. If there's any sort of um, questionable information, anything that doesn't tie together with what the service is that is supposedly being solicited to you, that's a real red flag and something you should absolutely delete and not take any action on and don't click on anything. Okay, here's one more, especially since I'm sure that a lot of you are um, online shoppers. This is one that I got from Amazon. I do shop on Amazon myself personally quite a bit, and so you'd think, wow, I got something with Amazon. Please respond immediately. My package could not be delivered. Well, I want my package, so I need to take action, right? There's so many red flags that we see in this, um, starting at the top. So if you look at that uh, the address, the Amazon at PP31PAE, it just goes on and on and on. That's clearly not from Amazon. It's going to be um, something at Amazon.com. Hands down, there's nothing that's going to be anything with any of this gibberish that you see in that URL. So that just straight away is very concerning and, and indicative of a scam. Same thing. We would like to inform you your password could not be delivered. Again, that goes back to getting under the ether, trying to create something, a sense of urgency. If, if there's a problem, what can you do to fix it? We'll click this right here and it'll fix it for you now. There's other things that, um, that you see that there's just, uh, luckily with my particular service provider, it caught this. So this looks like it's spam. But when I was going in just to take a look to see for points of uh, opportunities to show some examples today, it was in there, and it's, um, it's a prime example of what is really concerning about the emails that come in that you shouldn't be clicking on, certainly if you're not expecting. Uh, one thing I did want to mention before we move on to a, another few tips, especially related to the text scams and the phone scams that are out there, there's two different um, bills going on in the Oklahoma legislature right now, House Bill 1891 and 3168, which are both um, actively working to combat phone and text scammers uh, and, and unauthorized robocalls, or these calls that you uh, probably have gotten today. I know that I got two yesterday telling me that my car warranty had expired. Those are examples of some of, of the things that these bills are, are working to eliminate. Uh, if this is something you're interested in and you'd like to share with your lawmakers that you uh, would like for them to take action and support these bills, you can go to the URL that's on your screen there, action.aarp.org forward slash stop fraud. Uh, and that will give you an opportunity to make your voice heard and let your lawmakers know that you are also tired of getting these scam, text scams, phone scams, uh, and then these robocall scams, and you'd like for them to take action. Okay, so how do you protect yourself? Uh, keep your phone safe, keep your email safe, et cetera. Only open the emails from trusted sources. Um, and for me, you know, I, I talked about that email a moment ago that came from a retailer. Um, I expect to be getting emails from them, but I also expect that, that I have to make sure and be very diligent that it's actually coming from that trusted source. If you have a question, you're not sure if something's a scam or not, share it with a friend or a family member. Uh, tell them what you've gotten. Talk through the scenario and see if they feel like there's any red flags. Of course, you can call the Fraud Watch Network helpline and share with them over the phone what you're seeing. They'll be able to help you as well. But use uh, your friends and your resources to, to find out uh, if, something, if something doesn't quite look right, maybe they can help you decipher that. When you get the calls, the emails, texts come in, uh, if it's a number you don't recognize, don't answer it. If it's someone that really needs to speak with you, 
they'll leave you a message. Same thing with an email or a text. If it's someone that needs something from you uh, and it's someone you know, you can check in with them and see what they need exactly. If you're getting texts uh, that you didn't sign up for, just delete them. Um, it's, it's, that's one of the hallmark scams. Uh, even organizations that are legitimate that may have gotten a hold of your number and put you on some sort of list that you didn't sign up for, it's great to just delete those and move on. Don't interact with them. Don't click. Um, even you can go on, if something comes in that you think it might be pertinent to you, you might do a quick search on your internet uh, to see if there are other people are experiencing those scams. And then finally, just, just don't interact. Don't click or respond to anything that looks strange or anything that's unexpected. And another thing that I might mention in terms of um, things that are coming from trusted sources, Unfortunately, the hackers have gotten really smart and sometimes they can get into our emails and then send emails that look, that access our contact list, that look legitimate. Uh, if you get an email from someone that you know, that you're not expecting for you to click on a link or to access uh, something like a, a Dropbox type drive or something like that, it's really important not to click that because there may be something nefarious on the back end of that link. Uh, call your friend, call whoever it is. Um, don't, I would not respond directly to the email. I would create a new email if you're wanting to email them um, because there may be something in that, in that particular email that may be um, scammy. Okay, one of the things that I wanted to also show in terms of some examples of scam things that look very legitimate. It's this Facebook page for logging in. If somehow you get a text saying you, you need to log into your Facebook account to um, access your uh, updated information or something along the lines, uh, and it's not quite right, this is an example of one of the landing pages that is a scam, uh, a Facebook scam. Again, if you look at it, for the most part, everything looks exactly correct. The Facebook logo is correct. The typical boxes and login information is all exactly the same. The colors are the same. Even the fonts are the same that Facebook uses. But if you look up in the URL up there by where the red arrow is, and I made it a little bigger down at the bottom, that should be facebook.com forward slash login or something along those lines. Instead, it's some sort of scammy URL that had classic.solardiamond.com. And so it's clear, if you click on that and you enter any, any of your information into there, it's really not going to Facebook. It's going to somewhere that's a scam. And so if somehow you end up accessing something like this, that's a great spot to look, starting at the URL there. Uh, that's really important to do that, especially if you're providing any sort of login information. And so a little further, a couple additional things in terms of cyber safety, uh, especially if you're interacting with um, social networking sites like Facebook. Um, but if Facebook has the option called Messenger. Many of you um, probably use that if you're Facebook users. That's been a real significant issue in terms of fraudulent information scammers that um, send you messages through Facebook and they find you from a number of different avenues Maybe that you see some a friend of yours that says they've gotten hacked and then all of a sudden you're getting messages from someone that you don't know. It's very important to recognize that Facebook messaging is just ripe with scammers. It may be someone that in the instance of this particular situation is saying that there, you have cash that you need to, uh, that is unclaimed, that it's enti you're entitled to get. It may be someone that is, uh, being friendly and starting to try to create conversations with you to offer friendship or companionship, but you don't know them. It's really important that when these things come in, delete them. Do not interact with them. Be very critical of, of what's coming in. Also on this, unfortunately, these scammers have gotten smart and they're spoofing people you may know. So as an example, I got a, a message through Facebook Messenger from a loved one that said, hi, how are you today? And I thought, well, that's odd. Uh, this particular person and I have never interacted on Facebook Messenger. She would never ask me those questions. If she wanted to check in on me, she probably would just call me or we would text each other. 
uh, and th there's some really red, important red flags to notice there, even if it's someone that is you're expecting, you would potentially be interacting with. Um, there's something that's been going around called the grandparent scam that comes through Facebook Messenger, where uh, allegedly the grandchild says, uh, I need your help, I'm in jail, or I'm in some sort of trouble, I need you to buy a gift card uh, for $500 uh, and help me out with that, or I need you to call this person to get me out of jail. Those are real red flags that really should be very closely monitored and, and the utilization of things like Facebook Messenger uh, there's a lot of scams going on out there, and it's really important to be very critical of the information that's coming in. So if you suspect a scam, cut off contact immediately. Delete the message, delete the text, um, don't answer the phone, block the number on your phone if you have the ability to do that. If for some reason there's any sort of financial information that's requested, something that you do feel compelled to give, uh, again, be very wary of what's being asked. Certainly, if you uh, are looking at uh, transmitting or, or paying for anything that someone is asking for, um, never wire money. It's as good as gone when you wire money. Um, don't send money on things like um, cash apps that are out there. Cash apps are really only intended to transmit money between people who know each other. There are even retailers that are starting to utilize some of these cash apps, and it, it's an unsafe mechanism in which to transmit that money because you don't have the protections that you would through a banking institution or through a credit card. And then, again, we talked briefly about the gift card scams that are out there. Uh, gift cards are one of the most um, substantial ways that scammers are asking for money. And that it basically it's the same thing with wiring money. And even worse, that once you share perhaps the PIN number for the, the gift card that you've purchased to pay for whatever's being asked for, that money is gone and there's no restitution for you to get that back. And then finally, again, you're always welcome to contact us at the AARP Fraud Watch helpline, 877-908-3360. Uh, is that phone number. That's toll free. And as I mentioned earlier, the Fraud Watch Network services, the Fraud Watch Network helpline is free of charge to anyone to use, whether you're an AARP member, whether you're AARP age, it's free of charge for anyone. Okay, a couple of quick Facebook fakes that I just wanted to share, especially as it relates to a lot of the news that we've been all seeing related to Ukraine and Russia. These are a couple of images that were used with um, news stories, alleged news stories that were fake news, uh, talking about the different uh, some different areas in the in the conflict over in the Ukraine. And it turns out that the gentleman in this picture is not named Vladimir at all. That's who who uh, this news story said. And with a reverse image search on Facebook, it shows that someone stole this person's picture and fabricated it. And if you look where it circled, they, uh, they cut off part of his ear. And um, one of my uh, colleagues yesterday said, you know, it kind of looks like he got in a fight with Mike Tyson there, but really his ear has been trimmed off some in part of that fake news. And then same thing with Irina there. Same situation, someone stole her photo um, to utilize with a fake news story that had a, a, an agenda that was not accurate to what was being reported. She's, all, she's missing an earring. Her ears are uneven. There's some real red flags there as you start looking at um, news stories as you're digesting them on social media through Facebook or Twitter or the different online um, apps and sites. So it's really important to be aware of what you're reading to make sure that you're getting accurate information and you're getting correct and true information. When you're looking through to make sure that you're getting the, the safest information or the most correct and legitimate information, look at everything with a critical eye. Listen to your intuition. Uh, again, find the first use of photos. Through, there are several internet tools. If something doesn't seem quite right, to make sure that it's reputable. And then finally, follow reputable media sites for your information. Oftentimes, the things that you're seeing on social media, it may look legit. It may use the words that you feel like should be legit, or it may 
align with maybe some personal beliefs of yours. Um, unfortunately, the, on all sides, there are fake information sites out there, fake information feeds that are um, injecting into the different social media sites that we use. Make sure that you're using some of your local news sources that you trust. Uh, one of my favorite things that the Tulsa World has started just recently um, is that they do a fact or fiction segment uh, periodically that will talk about fake news of the week and then they will set the record straight uh, of the of the correct and verified information to debunk what may be fake. Uh, just some final protection tips and a recap. Again, do your research. Engage your inner skeptic. Uh, utilize your available resources to prevent fraud. One of the uh, great tools that uh, has been around for a little while, not a long, long time, is a, a great tool through the United States Postal Service that you can get a daily email so you'll know what's coming in your, in your actual mailbox every day. And it's great so you'll know if you're expecting a check in the mail from someone or you're expecting important information that have pri has private information such as tax documentation or health documentation. It's important for you to sign up for that so you know what should be coming in your mailbox every day just in case something doesn't show up. The other thing that's really important in utilizing the service, even if it's not something that you intend on checking every day, if you don't sign up for it with your own personal address, you're leaving your address open to a scammer to sign up, and then he or she will be getting the email every day to know what's coming into your mailbox. And then, you know, when they know that there's a check coming in or a payment of some sort, they can drive by or they can walk up steal that important check out of your mailbox or that important information, uh, and then that ca can cause some really significant problems. Uh, fortunately, the U.S. Postal Service does have a good sort of check and balance on that, but uh, if you go ahead and, and engage on that and get, it signed, get signed up for it sooner than later, you won't have to worry about those checks and balances. Uh, and you can just go to the USPS informed delivery uh, through the USPS website to get to that. And then finally, share your story. If you feel like you've been scammed or you feel like you've seen some, something scammy or uh, some sort of imposter situation going on, share it. Because odds are your neighbors, your friends at church, your colleagues, and your family members, they may have wondered, maybe have not been sure, or they may need support in terms of knowing what to do next if they've been scammed. Again, I talked a bit about the Fraud Watch Network, and as I wrap up, I just wanted to share the URL if you're interested in going there and learning more. You can go to aarp.org forward slash Fraud Watch Network. We offer a tremendous number of um, different tools, uh, constantly being updated with news articles, information about the latest scams. There's also a scam map of reported scams in your area that you can access to see some of the scam activity that's going on. And then, of course, again, um, information on how we're there to help you combat fraud. All right, so closing thoughts today, arm yourself with help. If you're unsure if it's a scam or if you feel like you might be victimized, absolutely call the Fraud Watch Network. Our volunteers are wonderful and trained uh, and available to help you. And then we encourage you to visit the AARP Fraud Watch Network site uh, to utilize all of the resources that are there for you. Uh, and then who doesn't want their own fraud watchdog? That's Jill McGill, my sweet rescue dog helping me fold t-shirts. And so nothing but a smile. I know we've talked about some dark things today and some scary things, uh, but Jill McGill's there to show her sweet face and, um, give you life that uh, we're out there and there's watchdogs out there for you. All right, and with that, I think that Ray and I are here to answer some questions and answers. Yes, thank you, Jill. Uh, seriously, folks, I wanna encourage you, anytime you suspect fraud, reach out to that Fraud Watch Network because not only can they help you, uh, you know, discuss with you what you think may be potential fraud, but they take that data and they are tracking and trending that. They're, they're getting it out there so that people are aware across the country about these uh, potential uh, scams that are taking place. And that may be the only message that some people get to protect themselves. So please take the time to do that. Uh, I'm always, I've seen that video that you showed before. 
uh, of this, for one thing, you know, the, the, a hacker's convention, I mean, is there law enforcement there to say, hi, welcome, and now join me in the squad car? Um, I'm always fascinated whenever I see that because this woman looks completely, this woman could be you, Joy. Uh, she looks completely normal. She doesn't sound different. She has no accent or anything that might, you know, tip you to something. She looks like a mom. And yet, these are the kind of people that are making these calls and they're utilizing tools on the internet, like a crying baby or some other sound effect to, to get you to that point. Um, I think I heard another speaker talk about how they'll use that crying baby. Some people sympathize with the mom. Other people are like, God, I can't listen to this crying baby anymore. I'll give this woman anything she wants just so I don't have to hear that anymore. So it's amazing that the, the tools that they use and you you just you can't trust it. You've just got to take that stance that it, it may be fake. If I don't know who these people are, I, I need to err on the side of safety. I wanted to ask you a question regarding the uh, credit freeze that people can put on there. You know, a lot of people are kind of leery of that. They're afraid of it. And I, I want to clarify, let's say that a person puts a freeze on their credit and they've got a couple of credit cards. If there's an established credit limit on that credit card, they're still able to use those credit cards. They just can't establish new credit. Is that correct? Or does it also so. on their credit card? I believe so. Okay. Uh, that was my understanding is that it, it keeps you from opening a new credit card or buying a car or something like that. But it doesn't mean you can't, if you're at JCPenney's and you see a, a you know, something you want to buy there, then by all means, if you've got that established credit limit, I think you're still okay there. Um, yeah. I think that just recently, um, a family member of mine um, we had a, a scare that we thought that there might have been a, a potential um, some fraudulent activity related to some benefits and uh, social security benefits. And so a credit freeze was placed. Uh, but then it came time that some uh, personal home things needed to be, to be purchased, uh, some new carpet, for example. Uh, and unfortunately, she couldn't buy that carpet right then and there um, through through establishing a new line of credit because her credit was frozen. So she had to get that unfrozen uh, if that was the method that she was going to move forward with and trying to get uh, that carpet paid for. So yeah, that's a great question. Okay, had another question that came in. I recently got an alert on my phone while using a password I assigned to an account that the password has been compromised. I do use this password across multiple apps. Is there a way to find out where the password was compromised? You know, there, there's a website, there's a few websites that are out there that will send you alerts if you sign up for that information. Um, but a lot of times if you, if, if for example, um, we'll talk, we'll use that yoga, daily yoga email that I get every day for an example. If for some reason I thought that that had been uh, compromised, probably what I would do is just go and put in that website or that app or whatever and say data compromisation. Um, and that probably is gonna be the quickest way for you to be able to get to uh, any sort of reported information recently uh, that has that information. And again, there are also a few other websites that I believe track that and you can sign up for those updates with your email address and it will tell you. Okay, uh, also wanted to share, you were talking about your banking institutions and how they're backing people up a lot more. They've got a lot more things in there uh, that they're using to help protect your credit. Uh, my wife and I had a situation last week where I had gotten a text message on my phone that I, I ignored. It was from a, a source that I didn't recognize, so I just kind of put it on the back burner. I went to the grocery store on the way home and uh, my card wouldn't work. And I tried it a few times because there should have been no reason why it wasn't working. And all of a sudden, for some reason, I thought about that text message, went back and looked at it. And it was my bank saying that there had been a charge that looked suspicious and they were waiting on me to respond to their text message, either yes or no before. The, and they locked up my card until they got the answer because they wanted to make sure that my card was not compromised. So I really appreciate it. It was kind of frustrating while I was standing at the cash register 
but I really appreciated them taking that extra step to uh, uh, to help protect you know my identity and my credit and stuff. It's not like there's a whole lot in there for somebody to steal, but what I've got, I'd like to keep. You know. Sure. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You can see on the screen here, folks. Here are the other events that we have coming up. Uh, we're really glad that we could uh, have you guys here today. Enjoy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming and joining us for this. Uh, there's always such good information. Um, it's good to keep on top of this stuff. The things that you were sharing with us, uh, the information about the telemarketers. Uh, that's a huge problem right now, not just when you're talking about uh, just scams in general, but just the telemarketers that are trying to sell you products. Uh, as part of AARP, I know that you guys are dealing with the same issue of um, people that are calling trying to sell people products that they really didn't reach out to find out more about. And that's a huge issue, and I'm really glad to hear that the legislature is taking steps to try to protect people uh, about that. So thanks again for joining us. And for everybody that did join us, thank you. We appreciate you being with us. Uh, we hope you'll join us for our other webinars that are going to be coming up shortly. Uh, if you haven't registered for those, you can go to our website at oid.ok.gov uh, forward slash senior fraud and register for the upcoming events. The next one, next Wednesday at 10 a.m., is going to be Jennifer Shaw. She's one of the attorneys with the Oklahoma Department of Securities, and she's going to be talking about protecting your investments. So we hope you'll join us for that. Also, don't forget, if you would like to listen to a recording of today's event, or the uh, past three events that we've done, those recordings are available on the same uh, website where you registered for this event. So again, you can go to oid.ok.gov forward slash senior fraud to listen to those uh, recordings. And one last time, I wanna put in a plug. If you do suspect fraud of any kind, please report it. Uh, we can stand up here and talk all day long about the ways fraud is impacting people and the different kinds of fraud that we're seeing. But unless you as the consumer take the time to reach out to someone to report that fraud, it doesn't do us any good and we can't do anything about this problem. So please play your part in fighting this problem. So with that, I will say good day and hope everyone has a great week. Bye-bye.